This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guy Batteries, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL, Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk fishing. It is a uh, is an ice bowl in Oklahoma. I walked outside this morning to see exactly how icy it was, and the next thing you know, I was laying on the grass, and as I... Uh, Let's just say when you hit 39, you're not as agile as you used to be in your late 20s. I'm sure if you've been there, you've had that moment where you feel agile until you realize that you are no longer agile. And as I rolled around the crunchy grass with approximately a half inch of ice on it, I realized that my days of agility are in the past. So uh, it's kind of weird because everything's frozen, but the season is like eight days from kicking off. Uh, there's a Toyota series that kicks off this week on Okeechobee. The open kicks off the following week. Uh, but right in between there, the Bass Pro Tour stage one kicks off January 30th on Toledo Bend. One of the guys who will be there is uh, I've known this guy a long time. Consider him a friend. Uh, we used to hang out more and then he got a 75 foot yacht and he goes out and he catches marlin and all these fish in the ocean. He's never around to hang out anymore. Uh, that is Gerald Spore, and Ed, 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 you're about to be a dad. You got a lot going on, Gerald. Thanks for jumping on BTL, returning to BTL. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing, I'm doing well. And and just to uh, set the record straight, you've been invited. I know, I've been, I've been busy too. The so the one time that I did go with you, I will say this: it is a top three fishing experience of my lifetime. Yep, I'm well, serious, are. and I've I've gone, I've done a lot of cool stuff. I I will admit that in my day, but that. The, the time we you took me down to Venice, top three fishing experience in my lifetime for species, scenery, company, and experience overall. Well, we do it way better now. Um, I, you setup, couldn't get better than that. Yeah, yeah. I just, I mean, I, I have a lot more um, versatility down there now. I have a lot more capabilities. Uh, we have our camp set up and 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 the boats and. And we're just, I'm, I'm way more outfitted now. So, so it'll be an even better experience next time you come. When we went, we put in, in Venice, just like in your boat, like your bass boat, just launch mm -hmm. normal. And then I don't know how the hell we didn't get lost. Cause you're running through marsh and backwaters. And then you'd randomly stop and just be like, here, let's catch some largemouth, Whack, whack, whack. And then you'd be like, here, let's catch some redfish. Whack, whack, whack. And you'd be like, here, let's catch some speckled trout. It'd be like every cast. And then we get to a spot and then we catch a bunch of sheep's head. And then you're like, all right, this is what we really came for. And then we were catching redfish that were, how, how long were those red? How long are they out there? Like 40 inches? Uh, they were 20, 20 30 pounds. pounds. Yeah, well, like yeah, 20, every cast. Pounders. Yeah, as many as you want to catch. And then we hooked a couple. <laughs> remember we hooked that one thing. I had no idea. It might have been a manatee. I have no idea what it was. Some sort of shark or something that spooled me. Or it, it, it was just, it was a cool experience. And then on the way in, we caught some more, some more bass. So, but you do yeah. the offshore thing primarily now. Yeah, now now I'm set up uh, to, to be able to do full-blown offshore marlin, tuna, uh, any kind of bottom fishing swordfish that's a that's one species that i target a lot now you know the last guy you started targeting swordfish now lives in the salt water and no longer bass fishes so just be careful with that you'll end up you'll end up pulling a crete and getting stuck down there in the salt the, the drawing power for the salt water is exceptionally strong because like if you see it mm -hmm. you can catch it like you go out knowing you're gonna catch something giant right Oh yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's, you know, I tell people all the time, I was like, do you want to just go catch fish that are easy to catch that you can take some pictures with and put on social media? Or do you want to go catch a fish of a lifetime and then be part of something special? Well, that takes a little bit more time. Uh, we might go all day for one bite, but when we catch that one fish, you're really going to brag about it. You might even take the time to go get you a replica to hang in your office or at your house. Uh, 
but if you want to go commit and go hunt for something that's a fish of a lifetime i can we can, can consistently consistently catch those kind of fish almost every time we go out so you just got to commit to it are you doing that deal where you like get it down a thousand feet with like a cinder block and then you break the cinder block on so you've got the bait down there in a thousand feet mm-hmm. and you're trolling around like underwater mountains uh so more like 1500 feet um even, even i've caught some in 1700 feet but i used to do that we call that a sacrificial weight where i, I deploy a giant carolina rig basically yeah uh, it's, it's about 150 foot long i use an eight pound weight and then i would use another <laughs> weight attached to the bait and uh so i can make specific drops on fish um i try to dial my electronics and i use simrad electronics offshore which is uh works with uh, Lawrence as well. They, they're the same company, but uh, we have transducers that cost like $5,000. I mean, they're really powerful transducers and I can actually mark these fish in 1700 feet of water. And I used to only know how to specifically get that bait in that fish's face if I used a sacrificial weight system. But now I've gotten so good at it. Now I don't even have to do it. I do a trolling technique and I throw the weight out the back and then deploy it and circle back around on it and then i can actually still i'm good enough now where i can i could actually hit that fish in 1700 feet of water with one single weight and uh mark it see it catch it there's 5280 feet in a mile correct gerald yeah oh i don't know you you're asking me yeah i don't know you have to- and you're 1700 feet down yeah So you're like a third of a, you're catching individual fish a third of a mile below the surface. Oh yeah. Uh, I'll put you this way. It's so far down. I have to pre-calculate in my head the amount of scope that I get in the line. So I use a 80 pound Seaguar braid and I will get an average of about 300 feet of just scope. What's that? So, uh, uh, Like, like bend in the line as it goes down. So so if I want to, if I want to be, in 1700 feet uh by the time i deploy all of that line i have to set my electric reel to 2000 feet to compensate for that 300 feet of scope um yeah so there's all these calculations in your head and stuff and you have to do it all on the fly and uh just to just to know where because you can't see your bait that far yeah. down but but i can mark the fish and i need to know where my where my bait's at in that water column it's taken you, so you started on this. I remember you've been through a number of different boats and when you started going offshore, but it's taken you, what, five years to get proficient at this? Yeah, yeah, my first boat. Um, and this is all going to lead into the whole point of this deal uh, of why I started this whole saltwater thing. Um, but my first boat, the only way I can really afford an offshore boat is I had I, I went and bought a really old one. Um, it was, it was like a 2003 model contender and it was pretty much shot all the electronics, all the rigging, the fuel tanks were corroded and leaking. And I took this boat and I completely ripped all the electronics motors off, uh, pulled the console off of it, cut the floors out, uh, put new fuel tanks in it which was about was 300 gallon capacity you know these are big fuel tanks Mm -hmm. put new fuel tanks in it refiberglassed it put the center console back in and completely re-rigged the boat from scratch so my first offshore boat i built uh, i worked on it every day for three months but when i was done i had a really sound piece of equipment uh, that i had a lot of equity in and so i I used that boat for a little bit and then I turned around and sold it and rolled that equity into my first catamaran. And I bought that boat prior to COVID. And then uh, when COVID hit and the boat prices went insane, I was able to sell that boat and ended up with a bunch of equity in it. And then, so now I'm like compounding equity. And then I rolled that into uh, the boat I have now. Uh, which is which is a machine. I mean, this is a locally built catamaran. Uh, they built them in Louisiana called an Encore. And and this boat, 
I leveraged the Miami Boat Show and uh, was able to get a slip in the Suzuki booth in Miami um, and then put this boat in the Miami Boat Show for demo rides. And then I leveraged that with all my sponsors to, to rig this boat out and build it. And now I have a ton of equity in this boat, but I was able to get in a boat that I would have never even dreamed of was possible by just constantly compounding in it and finding ways to um, get deals on things and make it worth everybody's while. And now I have a, a serious offshore fishing machine. I can actually fish tournaments out of this boat. Is it a aluminum hull? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. I think I found it. I want to make sure. We'll do the, sh the screen share to show what it is. Is that it right there? Like something like that? Yeah. Yeah. That one has quads on it. Um, yeah. My my I have the the twin engine. The mine's thirty three feet long, 10, 10 foot wide. Uh, that's that's a forty foot model right there with quads. That's the one we're gonna build in probably twenty 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 five. That's freaking cool. What is the, so that reminds me, what is the, uh, have you heard of that? It's on YouTube. The guy who starts and he like buys something at a garage sale and then he flips it and then he flips it and then he flips it and he like starts out with like a ballpoint pen and he ends up with like a house. Have you ever seen, yeah. seen that? That's yeah. basically what you've done with offshore boats. Yep. That's it. In a roundabout um, way. So I've, I've learned to take advantage of the relationships I have in the freshwater world. And a lot of the company, all of my sponsors are freshwater, saltwater companies. They, they, they work on both ends of the, of the business. And uh, so it, it actually costs me money not to be built on a boat right now because <clears throat> I can get my electronics, my mm -hmm. engines, um, sound systems from wet sound audio, Electronics come from Simrad, engines, Suzuki. Uh, if I need jack plates, Bob's machine, I, I can go on down the list. I can build an entire boat. And pretty much the only thing I'm, I can't get a deal on is is the hull itself mm -hmm. or a trailer. But everything else, I can I can rig a boat out. Now we're talking about electronics packages for an offshore boat. They're three times the cost of what we put in bass boats, and you already know how much we spend on those. Yeah. So that kind of leads into what. Uh, what the show is about today, which I love it when anglers reach out and say, hey, I have something that I think would play really well with a Bass Talk Live show, which is exactly what you did. And it really caught my attention. And and that was uh, leveraging sponsors, making relationships in the industry without primarily relying on social media, which is exploded over the past uh two years to where you have guys that are like well i'm not a social media guru i might as well not even try anymore but i'm intrigued as to kind of your system and and how you've made it work uh because you have a new title sponsor this year so just kind of get into uh your thoughts on that which i think will lead full circle back to kind of how we open the show yeah so <clears throat> You know, I, I've always kind of kept my tactics uh, secret because it wasn't, you know, I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to show my cards, but I've made a level uh, a living in this sport. And I think if I had to guess, I don't know everyone's deals, but I know a lot of people's deals. If I had to put myself, I say, in a percentage on... Uh, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just trying to put things in perspective. As far as top paid anglers in the sport, I would put myself for sure in the top 10%. And it's not, you know, I don't have the biggest YouTube channels. I don't spend all my time on social media, walking around with cameramen and doing all this other stuff to try to compete in the same space as these guys. Like I'm behind the scenes uh, with my sponsorship really. And and before I used to really not tell people how, how I was achieving that. But then as the years went on, um, this, this last non-endemic sponsor I have, which is a Brown and Root, which is a huge industrial service company. They have 10,000 employees and it's actually a hundred year old company. They made their hundred year anniversary in 2019. And this company has never, ever been 
in the sport of bass fishing. They don't even, I don't even know if they've ever even sponsored anyone before. Um, but it got their attention because over the last, let's see, I've been professional fishing for nine years now, and I've had a, an, a non-endemic sponsor in this category for since I started my career. And then there's some other ones that noticed the, I guess, the exposure these companies were getting. And, and then they came in. Um, you have three or four different companies in the same part of the industry that are sponsoring other anglers now. And I like to attribute that to, to the original. I had, I'll put it this way. I had a six figure non endemic sponsor when I fished the opens before I was even a pro. Hmm. And, and I'll tell you how I did that and how I made that worth it to them. But, but that led to the next sponsor I had, which was SWAT. Uh, mm -hmm. I was with SWAT for six years. Well, SWAT's in the position now where the, the company is, you know, getting bought out with investment groups and everything else, just like a lot of big businesses do. And um, it's not 100% privately owned anymore. So, uh, you know, almost every sponsor has an expiration date on it. But if you can get six years out of a non-endemic sponsor, that's really good. Absolutely. And then that led to... Uh, other competitors in the space sponsoring some other anglers because they liked the presence that they were getting. And they actually had customers asking questions to these other competitors in the space um, saying like, Hey, why, why y'all don't have, why, why y'all don't sponsor an angler? And then next thing you know, they're sponsoring an angler. And then that ended up coming full circle whenever the SWAT deal was going away for me. I only talked to one other company. And they knew about professional bass fishing because they had some of their direct competitors sponsoring anglers. So they saw, they knew about that marketing avenue. And so it was not, um, it wasn't, they weren't unfamiliar with it. They knew exactly what I was talking about whenever I presented it to them. And then that's why I ended up with Brown and Root because, so it, it over the years, we've kind of brought these companies into the industry and that ended up helping me in the long run to get the next one. And so then I started thinking about it and I was like, you know what? It seems now whenever you look at all these competitors, whether it's Bassmaster Elite Series or whether it's Major League Fishing, they're just covered up in endemic sponsorship. And I noticed 15 years ago, there was way more non-endemics in the industry and we've lost focus on trying to get these sponsors. Um, a lot of them was brought to the industry by the organizations like FLW, uh, how they mm -hmm. brought in all that Walmart stuff and everything. It was just, I mean, hell, it seemed like 50 plus percent of the sponsorship was non-endemic 10 years ago. And now, now it's just, everyone's got the same Jersey and the same, mm -hmm. same rap. And it's like, yeah. whoa. And everyone's also at the same time talking about how there's no sponsorship in the industry and they can't make any money and they're starving to death. Basically it's like, because y'all are just going down the same path and y'all are just following each other. Uh, it's it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. It's like, Hey dude, break off and let's go, go. There's so much sponsorship around you. You just have to identify it and come up with a plan to get it. Um, and so I said, let's start having this conversation because it helps us all. They always say a rising tide floats all ships and that so me bringing companies like this into the industry has has helped other anglers mm -hmm. uh, get these kind of sponsorships. And, and who knows what it, if a guy can go out and get a Coca-Cola or or whatever, you know, or, or a, a Shell Oil or Marathon or whatever, come and bring those companies into the industry. They start getting the attention of other companies and then more anglers start getting these types of sponsorships, which these types of sponsorships pay tremendously more than the endemic sponsorships. All right. I've always had this question, Gerald, you're the perfect guy to answer this. You're talking sometimes billion dollar companies that we're talking about. You're talking high end, like uh, SWAT is like a lot of welding stuff, right? 
Mm-hmm. And uh, you can throw throw Brian Knight with Knighton Industries, big supporter of professional bass fishing. His team series are kicking ass right now that are airing uh, that are airing on TV. Brian also owns a, a bait company, Epic, and things like that. But you know, you see Knighton Industries on the side. He started with Goldbeck back in the day. <laughs> Goldbeck had the the Knighton wrap. Uh, you're talking about Brown and Root here. So exactly what type of value are these massive companies seeing? Because so like if a guy like me, like it, it, are they looking for, for just exposure? Are they looking to use you to solidify deals with potential customers? Is it a feather in their cap? Like what is the, the with them as Mark Jeffries, who hosted the show for 18 years used to say for me, the what's in it for me, for them, obviously we know how well they're supporting the anglers, but what does the company get out of that sponsorship to help them ultimately sell more product, become more valuable, get more deals? Yeah. So I'll tell you specifically with what my expectations are with Brown and Root. Yeah. Um, and then we can, you know, that, that doesn't work for every single non-endemic. You can't just say, Oh, this is what Gerald's doing for Brown and Root. This is what I'm going to go offer somewhere else. You have to, mm-hmm. We'll get into that, but you have to identify what a company's needs are specifically and try to uh, deliver on okay. that. Uh, that was a fair question, though, isn't it, that I yeah, asked? Yeah. I didn't want to throw you completely off track, but that's always <sighs> been my main thing is I get it. I understand it. It makes sense. But how does that benefit these multi-giant companies? So Brown and Root, uh, that they're, they're in a growth phase right now they're growing okay. rapidly so anytime a company is in a growth phase uh that's whenever they they want to spend more money on marketing because they're trying to grow and but they they you know they're not going to just spend money you let's get down to the reality of it we don't move the needle as much as we want to think we do as anglers like me covered up with Brown and Root is not going to bring them hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work. It may help bring some brand recognition to the industry, which leads to what potentially could lead to, uh, say, we're at a chemical plant. Mm -hmm. If you don't know this industry, I'm just going to keep it in basic terms. But if you're at a plant, a chemical plant, and you want to hire Brown and Root, or you want to hire a company to come in there and do what we call a turnaround. Uh, and the turnaround might be worth $5 million. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it's like, all right, now we're going to put this up for bid and we're going to invite 10 companies to come put a bid in on this turnaround. Well, okay. they might have not even been thinking of a Brown and root, but that brand awareness just reminds them they might say we need to make sure oh i forgot about brown and root they're a legitimate company in this space let's go ahead and send them a bid invite and let them come over here and bid and then they have a chance an opportunity to go in there it's just i remember one time we did a a, a survey Bassmasters did this because I, I asked for this marketing report when i first got on the elite series they they uh they they figured out that 30% of the industrial industry follows bass fishing. Okay. And so I don't know what that number is now. This was an assessment that was done back in um, 2015. Okay. And, 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 and so 30% of that industry. So no matter what chemical plant or refinery you go to, someone in that plant follows what we do and, uh, and, and sees that logo. And You're the foot in the door the foot in the door. That's you. Yeah. So, so that from the marketing perspective, they like that just to basically keep the logo in front of someone's face and then present it in a different, uh, it's not just a billboard on the road. It's presenting it in a more fun manner, Mm -hmm. Um, like attaches the brand to a, to a person and then gives them something to follow and become a fan of. That's been the whole theory of, of the type of marketing you run through NASCAR or anything else. It's like you become more personally attached to a brand when you have a mm-hmm. person that's competing. And so it gives more substance to the brand. Um, and so that's the method there. And then, but, you know, that's only one part of it. And then 
but my expectations with Brown and Root, what I, what I, I guess my deliverables, um, as I created this whole, this whole offshore fishing thing, and that mm-hmm. was an investment that I made in, in, in myself, uh, because I wanted to offer something to sponsors that was more valuable to them. So a lot of these companies, they'll pay to take people on hunting trips. They'll pay for these charter trips. Well, a charter trip in Venice, Louisiana is about $3,000 plus the cost of fuel. So a day trip uh, for six guys to go on a day trip, tuna fishing, it's going to cost a company between four and $5,000 just for the trip. That's not counting the lodging. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I invested and I built a, a camp in Venice, Louisiana. Um, uh, I got a boat now that's suitable and comfortable to take any, anyone on these trips. Um, so I can house them, take them fishing. I cook for them and you know how I like to cook. Uh, <laughs> You're cook damn good them. at it too. I'm going to wine and dine them. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, so they're getting a return on their investment and they're getting their marketing dollars and basically getting all those marketing dollars back at something they to spend anyway. And you're developing a relationship with them and you're offering mm-hmm. something that no one else can. It's a brilliant strategy, Gerald. Yeah. So I went and got my, my captain's license so I can be a, a licensed captain. So if I'm going to take the plant manager for a, for a, a giant customer, um, you know, from a liability standpoint, and it's like, we have a license. They can, the salespeople can tell their customer, we have a licensed captain on retainer that can take you on these fishing trips and um and then come to find out they may be a fan of major league fishing or or mm-hmm. me in general and like man i really want to go fishing with that guy can i bring my son i bring their families and everything um and then it's all about these companies spend a lot of money on business development and relationships growing these relationships with these customers to build that trust because when these plants talk about they're going to shut down for X amount of days to do a critical path turnaround, they want to hire people that they can trust because they can't afford to deviate from timelines. Mm-hmm. Um, so they just they want to be able to count on people. So to build that trust, that, that, that takes a, a lot of, of, of time um, and continuity. And they, 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 need, they need to know you're going to answer the phone and count on you. And so we build a lot of that trust on these hunting trips, fishing trips, uh, when we take these families and we talk business and, and I know the business. So, um, so that's, that's, I guess, instead of a company going out and buying their own boat, paying a separate captain, buying their own camp, or, you know, I brought these assets to the table. So I created these assets, uh, which I have put a value on, and then I presented that as, as like, hey, I pay the insurance. I have I take the liability. I own the boat. I own the lodging. And I'm going to spend my time. And that's one part of my deal. And on top of that, I'm going to promote you and advertise you on, on a national stage through the media platform that I have in professional fishing. Um, and so that's how I presented it to, to them. And so whenever they sat there and put a dollar value on that, it was a no brainer for them to pay that, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm just not knocking on the door and saying, uh, Hey, can you write me a check and I'm going to wear your logo and your company's going to blow up. That's, that's unrealistic expectations. And even if you can convince a company that you're going to do that, that their company is going to double in size if they put logos on you, they're only going to believe that for one year. And so it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, So you need to give them realistic deliverables. And that way at the end of the year, it's a no brainer for them to uh, re up the contract or keep continuing to pay you. Uh, If you, if you lie to them and make them promises that you can't deliver on, you're just going to run this company clean out of bass fish and they'll never even come back. Yeah. Because it was like, man, we did that. That was stupid. That didn't work. So you actually have to have a plan and you have to achieve it. Um, so I'll give you a comparison. That was That's what my deliverables are now for, for Brown and Root. But previous to that, in my first non-endemic, you're probably wondering how did I have a six-figure non-endemic sponsorship when I was fishing the Opens? Um, you know, because I couldn't really you had a, sell. Wait, say that again. 
you had a six figure non endemic sponsorship when you were fishing the opens. Yes. So at that point, you'd only been bass fishing like five years, right? I was a nobody. Yeah. I mean, you're still a somebody. You just weren't known on the national stage. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one second. Let me. Uh... I'm interested in hearing this. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So basically, I was working for Shell Chemical. I was a Shell Chemical employee. Um, and we, and I dealt with a lot of contractors that, that, uh, that came into the plant and I oversaw them. Uh, and so I had some relationships with, mm-hmm. with, with some contractors already. And they had one particular contractor that wanted me to quit my job for shell and go work for the contractor. Well, I was like, I'm not going to quit working for shell because with shell, I had a, a pension, uh, uh, you know, I had full benefits. Mm-hmm. It was, it was good. Like if you're going to work in the industry, I had probably one of the best positions you can have before I started professional fishing. Well, this company kept asking me to come and work for them. And at the same time, I was just starting to fish the opens. This was in 2013 is whenever I was fishing the opens. And then I was burning all my vacation to fish the opens Um, and, and then I finally was like, man, you know, if I'm going to go pro, eventually I'm going to have to quit my job and it's going to be really hard to quit my job. So I was always planning ahead, trying to save my money. Um, that way, whenever I did make it to the elite series, I would be able to walk away from a company like Shell. Well, after having a bunch of conversations, I kind of hit myself on the forehead. I was like, man, come up with a way to to work for this company and still bass fish. So then I started thinking, you know, title sponsorship, you do whatever you can to get it. And really all you're trying to get out of the company, instead of just saying, I'm trying to get money out of you, you're just trying to get flexibility to be Mm -hmm. able to fish whatever you want to fish. And so I tell people all the time, I was like, dude, go in there and tell them you'll sweep the floors but present yourself as an employee to the company instead of just trying to say you're going to advertise for them. So you, when you go to, I like to start local. Um, You find out what companies are locally around you that you, that are in a growth stage and you go to these companies and you say, dude, I'm really looking for an employment opportunity that allows me to also pursue bass fishing. So I'll be on the road for two weeks fishing And if I'm home for a week, I'm coming over here. And if I got to work 12 hours a day in between, but I'm leaving again the next Friday to go to the next tournament. And if you just let me have that flexibility, I'll make it up in the off season. And every second I'm home, I'll work as much as you need me to, to justify that pay that I'm asking for. And and instead of asking a company, just sponsor me. He's like, I just want employment with flexibility. And that's what I did with, with this, uh, my first sponsor, Catalyst Handling Resources, um, I said, I'll work for you if you just allow me to fish. And um, and I, basically, whenever I'm not fishing, I'm going to come work for mm-hmm. you. And, and, and a lot of these turnarounds in the plants, um, we work a schedule of seven twelves, and you can work days or nights. And, and so I would come home, if I was home for seven days, I would go on these turnarounds and I would run these projects and they would have me in a supervisor role because I was overseeing these contractors anyway, whenever I was working for shell, but I would go in there and run these projects until it was time to leave again. And I did that for two years uh, is I had that six figure contract, but I was an employee and all Mm -hmm. I wanted was the flexibility. And we found a way to work that out. Um, people have heard me tell the story before, but uh, at the end of the year, they was kind of questioning on renewing my contract. They were like, man, did we, did we get enough hours out of him and everything? And so then my negotiation was like, okay, what, what do I need to do in the off season to, uh, to maintain this employment status to where I can continue to do this. So 
2015, I was fishing the open. 2015 and 16, I was fishing the open. 16, I was fishing the FLW tour. Mm-hmm. But I qualified for the Elite Series in 2016. And so the Elite Series was asking me for a $48,000 entry fee check. And I was <laughs> like, man, I had already saved that kind of money um, to to be able to pay that entry fee, but I didn't want to burn through my savings to write my first check to the elite series. Uh, actually it was, so it was 48,500 if you paid it in payments, but it was 45,000 if you paid it all at once. So you saved over $3,000 if you paid it in full. So I wanted to pay it in full because you know, that's, that's almost like one free tournament if you pay it in full. Um, and so they, they said, yeah, we have this big job going on overseas in, in Kuwait. If you want to go over there and run that project, uh, you'll be there for about 30 days. And, but you'll make, you'll make enough money to be able to cover your entry fees and uh, if you do this for us, because they were kind of in a bind, they couldn't really find the right guy to go to Kuwait that was willing to leave mm-hmm. their family. Um, and so they they needed me and I needed them. And so, of course, I was like, OK, I'll do it. And so I went to Kuwait and worked for 30 days and I actually mailed my check for my elite series, my first elite series season. I mailed it from Kuwait. So it showed up to Bassmasters headquarters with an Arabic stamp on it. <laughs> and, and you know that's that's just an example of you you got to do whatever you can to be valuable to these companies and you need to see what their needs are this company's needs were they needed me in a leadership role mm-hmm. and they needed my consult I, I was able to consult a lot of their jobs because i was experienced in their industry uh and, and, and they that's what they needed from me. That's why they wanted to hire me so bad in the first place. But what I needed from them was the flexibility. And, mm-hmm. and so we was able to work that out together. So that was how I got my first big non-endemic. And then I was also going into these plants, um, these chemical plants and refineries. I was going through the gates and onto the job site with a wrapped bat, wrapped truck with a basketball wrap on it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so it was getting a lot of attention in the plant because like I said, you got 30% of the people in that industry that are fans of the sport or follow it in some sort of way. They were, they were all walking up to me on job sites, taking pictures with me and stuff. And then that got the attention of the next of SWAT because I was working on jobs side by side with SWAT and so SWAT, um, the owner of SWAT, Johnny Holyfield, Johnny was a, he's a big time bass fisherman and he was trying to grow his company. It was a brand new company and mm-hmm. he was like, man, this, he saw the value in it. And so at that point, Johnny come to, well, I actually went to Johnny and pitched it to him and he was like, we want, we want the whole thing. We want a truck and boat wrap. We want SWAT all over everything. And, uh, but you don't have to work for us. You just we just want you out there uh, representing our company and and then any of our customers that are fans of the he had a lot of customers that were that were fans of the sport. Um, And he was very in touch with that because he he himself was a fan of the sport. So these people that wanted a chance to go fishing with me, I would take them fishing. So which could close a multi million dollar deal for SWAT a couple days on the water with you if they're between a couple companies right and we got a guy who's going hey i got a guy i i got a guy i got gerald he's my guy he fishes the top level you you like bass fishing here hop in the boat and let me give him a call right now and then they go out with that and then it'd be like dude now all of a sudden they're in the lead so that is where their money that they spend on you makes them a bunch more money in the long term because all you have to do over the entire course of their relationship is close one deal that push that company over the edge and you've just made them millions. It, yeah. And in, a round, and in a very simple type of way. And yeah, I, you know, I might not directly close the deal, mm-hmm. but it's all part of continuing to build those relationships and any company can take a guy deer hunting or any company can hire a charter and take a guy fishing. But if a guy specifically wants to go fishing with a, with a professional angler that he's a fan of, 
It's like you can't really go buy that, you know. And so it was kind of a, um, a unique offering. And being that, that the industry was so big and our customer base was so big, it didn't matter if I was fishing on Lake St. Clair in Detroit. When you're driving down the interstate at Lake St. Clair, you know that big refinery there with the basketball uh, marathon refinery? Like, like one Is that of right steers. before you go right before you go into the river? Yeah. On the yeah, right hand like, side, like if you're yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You can't miss it. You're driving, yeah. you're driving down the interstate and they got this giant refinery with like a basketball. That's one of their holding tanks that they put product okay. in. Um, but you know, that's one of our customers was there. Huh. And so I'm taking I'm, while I'm up there fishing Lake St. Clair, when the tournament's over, I'm taking one of the decision makers of that facility on a smallmouth bass fishing trip. Um and and it was all about just building relationships and i know the business so if we had to talk work i understood i, un I can have those conversations um and in the meantime it was just like i said building those relationships and and uh so there so the company can grow uh with their personal relationships um and that's what it's all about is relationships and 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 helping them grow at the same time. So it, it brought a lot of attention whenever I started uh, representing SWAT, because first of all, that name just stands out. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, should we put something under the logo that says what we do? And Johnny was always like, I'm not worried about it. The people, the you people know, that know. I, who, the people who should know will know. And, and he, that's all he really cared about. And um, and so he would all anytime I was doing good, he would get a lot of phone calls and text messages and they would turn on live in the office and everything. And uh, so that was a perfect relationship um, there. And that lasted for a really long time, six, six seasons. And then and then whenever the opportunity came up with Brown and Root, um, you know, Brown and Root's trying to they're already huge, but they're they're uh, at another growth stage. They're trying to achieve another level, um, and and so it fit for them. But to to justify it, I had to bring a whole another strategy, and then that's when I decided over the years to try to bring these assets and 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 then to maintain my SWAT deal. I knew at some point they got to the point where they have already grown. And the marketing side of it wasn't as intriguing to them. And mm -hmm. so it was, so I started creating these assets, the, the camp down in Venice, the offshore boat uh, and, and offering to take people, not just bass fishing, but on these big uh, excursions out in the Gulf of Mexico. I felt like if I can do that for their customers, then that would make me more valuable and it would prolong my SWAT relationship. And then, um, and so whenever SWAT was ready to go, I have, I had created all this stuff. And then now whenever I present this to a non-endemic sponsor, not only do I have a media deck that shows all the exposure they're going to get, I also have this whole other strategy to save them money and uh, build these relationships. And, and then I have the resume to support all that now. So it, it helps. So if you're a guy who's fishing a BFLs and you're like, man, I, I, I don't have time to get off to practice. I want to do this. You can take your strategy. Now you're dealing with big offshore boats and billion dollar companies and at the top level of professional fishing, but you can just scale this down to yep. your local level. Like I've just wrote down, you know, construction, car dealerships, plumbing, real estate, any of that mm -hmm. stuff. Take what you just said and some of the key components that you just said, and you can leverage that to, uh, to instead of just going and say, Hey, do you want to put your logo on the side of my boat? And they're like, no, showing them the value and the return in it at a smaller level. And there's a lot of that kind of opens up so many more possibilities instead of them just shooting your resume off to one of the big five to pure fishing or Pradco or striking and hoping that you can get percentage off bait. You're, you're taking exactly what you did, but applying it to the relationships that you have in your community, just like you did. You can do it uh, at any level and for any type of company. Uh, basically, the strategy that I have present mm -hmm. yourself as an employee 
uh, if you have a skill, if you already know a trade, that's even more valuable. So I don't care if you if you frame houses mm -hmm. and you can go to the the biggest local contractor in your area uh, and he may build X amount of houses a year. He might be a five million dollar company and this dude builds the most houses out of anyone. And, you know, he pays his guys twenty five bucks an hour or whatever his top hands. And you go to them and you're like, hey, man, you know, I, I, I want to represent the company. Uh, the only thing I'm asking you to do is give me the flexibility and I'm going to come over here. I'm going to frame houses when it's all said and done. You can't just have the mindset that, oh, I'm just going to fish. Mm -hmm. You have to have the mindset is I'm going to work and fish, but you just need to allow me to fish um, and, and I'll make the I'll make it up. And you can and if you have the skills, you might be. For before you decide to pursue professional bass fishing, you might be the top guy at a company. So you can go to whenever, you know, that company might say, well, we're not going to let you fish. But then you can go and offer that skill set to a competitor and say, hey, dude, if you just wrap my truck and boat and you pay me a salary, basically, I'm going to make the time up whenever I'm not competing. And y'all come up with a, an agreed upon schedule on how much you fish and all this other stuff. And then that's how you get that sponsorship um, instead of you, instead of thinking of it as like, Oh no, that just makes me an employee. It, it doesn't matter what sponsorship you get for any sponsorship, whether it's endemic or non-endemic for it to be sustainable. You're going to have to work for these people. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. You know, it, it happens running a podcast. Yeah. You, you're going to have to put in the time, whether it's um, on the time with on the water or going to shows or whatever, regardless, you have to commit the time. But if you think outside of the box and you look at your local area and you say, man, what companies would actually might would actually be interested in this? And then, it, and then you go and attack those companies that opens an entire world up that people aren't even thinking of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and even if you don't have a skill set or a trade, um, like I said, everyone has a base level job whether it's, I don't care if it's sweeping the floors, like, dude, I'll come in here and clean the bathrooms and clean the office and make sure the shop looks good. Um, I'll drive the forklift whenever I'm here, whatever you got to do, but a company is going to respect you more and it, it'll make more sense to them. And if he's like, well, okay, all right, how many hours, of, how many hours am I actually going to get out of you? And you're like, well, when I'm home, I can work as many hours as you need me to, which may be 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And he starts putting that on paper and he's like, I'm going to pay you a salary of this. This is what I pay my guys that costs X and you're going to work X amount of hours for me a year. If you guarantee me that you're going to work 800 hours a year, then this is the sponsorship that the, the mm -hmm. bonus they get out of it for the flex. I mean, I guess for the, um, the ability, for the, to willing, the willingness to be Lord. part of this, they're like, I'm going to pay this dude anyway. I'm going to pay an employee anyway. So I might as well pay this dude. And he's going to be out there running around with a truck and boat wrap advertising at the same time. So that's their incentive uh, that they get. They get the best of both worlds, but they're still getting an employee. This is, this is fascinating because at that open level that you're mentioned, uh, I can personally think of a commercial cleaning company that was owned by an angler who fished, who employed several other anglers, who fished the opens, who ran wraps for that cleaning company and then worked for him during the off season when they weren't fishing tournaments. I can also think of one of my buddies who fishes the open right now, who's in the roofing game, very outgoing, willing to do whatever it takes, wants to get in the game and fish the opens talking to people at the job site, talk to a guy who said, Hey, I think I could implement this exactly like what you just said. You know, he goes to trade shows every year. He represents that company. He's got the boat and truck wrap and they're three years in and thrilled with what he's doing. He hasn't won an open. He hasn't fished at the top level, but he's taking his skill and his trade did exactly what you said, except on a smaller level. And he's comfortably fishing the opens now because of it. What you're saying isn't, isn't hypothetical like it isn't a fairyland thing i can the more you mention it i can think of more and more examples of guys who are doing exactly this and you don't realize it too you says oh it's so it's a but you get to know him and you're like man this guy's doing it right because he has a lot of times benefits 
which is huge in this game for it. He typical independent contractors. He has benefits. He has long-term relationships with the company. So therefore it's not, Oh my God, I didn't catch him this year. I'm totally screwed because you're providing more for that company than without it. And, uh, you're developing relationships that, you know, the tentacles, like you said, you're, you can, when one company is ready to move on, the door opens for another one. So that's good yeah, stuff. For, you know? for nine years, I've been professional bass fishing. Oh, I quit my job in 2015 and started pursuing this. Since 2015, I've had health insurance, 401k, and I've been on a salary. You know, that's the drill. So, that's massive. That's massive. Yeah, I have a full blown retirement. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not going to get this with an endemic sponsorship. Um, so it, that's what I'm saying. It's, and then I'm seeing less and less of these endemics. And I mm-hmm. tell my buddies, like my local buddies that fish, like, Caleb Summerall, uh, Logan Latuso, like all these guys that fish locally, whenever they, I, I kind of started right before them. And, and, and so, and they, they know how successful I've been. And they're like, man, how do we get, they, they make fun of me. They say, how do we get a Gerald deal? And then I, Work and, your I ass I, off. and so that I've already told them how to, how to do it. Um, and so they know, they know the deal. But then I started thinking, I was like, man, there's no reason to hold this back. You know, the more guys we have out there trying to bring these companies into the industry, that mm-hmm. better it's going to help the entire industry, um, especially going into 2024. The endemic sponsorship in 2024 is basically no one added any money to their budget. And a lot of people cut their budget because 2024 is anticipated to be uh, completely different than the last few years for the fishing industry. So no one's spending any money. So going into 24, guys are like, well, there's no sponsorship out there. There is. You just got to look at it from a different lens and, um, and, and, and be willing to do it a different way, which they should be doing in the first place. It's probably really good that we're going into a year where new endemic sponsorships really non-existent. And it's going to force people to have to look at it through a different lens in which in turn, 25 and 26, you'll probably see a lot of unique endemic, a uh, non-endemic sponsorship because guys had to go out and get it. Um, and so this is just a way to help people come up with a plan. You know, I mean, the biggest thing you could do is wherever you live, there's something, I promise you. And you, you got to identify what that is, like who that is. Learn everything you can about their company. Figure out what you can offer them. Um, and then come up with a, with a plan to approach them, find out if they like bass fishing or not, because it's a lot easier. It, you don't want to walk in there and, and, and present this whole idea to them. And they don't even know what the heck you're talking about. You know, mm-hmm. so you really want to try to find those companies, um, that kind of already understand, but I mean, there's a lot of people at Brown and Root that doesn't know anything about professional fishing, but since they uh, presented this deal to them, they they've all they're they're all on board. They all are excited to follow me now. Um, That's cool. Yeah, they're like, oh, I guess we're gonna start watching fishing now. You know, they didn't <laughs> even watch it before, so it is possible for you to go to a company that doesn't know anything about it and bring them into the industry. But it helps if you've got a guy or two kind of understands how it works. Yep, yep, yeah. and it also helps. If you know someone like an aunt or an uncle or a friend or whatever that already works for a company, go go lean on that person and say, hey, man, can you get me a meeting? Maybe bounce the ideas off of them first and say, what do y'all need over there? And they're like, man, we really we're missing two or three shop guys right now. Or we need two guys out in the field or we need a, a sales dude to get in a truck and go handle these accounts or find out what the company's needs are. That way, when you go to them, they're, they're paying attention. You're like, hey, I heard you I heard you really need uh, a, a rep to drive around in the truck and go visit all these sites once a month or whatever. And you got all these different accounts. You need you need me to follow up on all these accounts. I can be a rep. And then they're like, oh, wow, I got this potentially top employment's really tough these days for a lot mm-hmm. of companies. So if you're a smart guy and you're willing and you can walk in the door, they're like, 
man, I'll take I'll take this really good employee. All I got to do is work with him around his fishing schedule. And it's way more interesting to them yeah. that way. And like that's taking a step out. That's risking it. But if this is what you want to do for a living, if you need the sponsorship to do it, you have to be willing to make sacrifices, do things that are uncomfortable, step outside your comfort zone. And, it, and, and if if your dream is to <sighs> pursue this, this is a means to be able to pursue it without putting potentially your family, your financial security in the future, your savings in jeopardy. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, that's the thing. You, you, I, I run into people all the time. They, you know, and this is people in general, and this is just reality is a lot of people have a lot of excuses. Um, they could tell you, tons of reasons why they wanted to be a professional bass fisherman, but why they couldn't make it work. Um, and the biggest thing is money. I can't afford it. I had a family, uh, all this stuff, but you know, very few of us in professional bass fishing were able to afford it when we started. It, you know, I couldn't, I, how can, how can I sit there and justify a $48,000 entry fee check, which was, more than which was half of what my complete yeah. salary was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's if you think about how much you paid for your house for the year, if you got a $2,000 a month house note, you know, that's double of what you would have paid an entire year for your house. Uh, so you can't justify it. I don't care what you say, but if you, if you like, I need to make this work. This is what I want to do. This is ways to make it work. And you got to actually build a business plan, have a strategy uh, and make it all a sustainable strategy, not like a far fetched. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put my logo on this stuff and I'm going to, and this, this dude's phone's going to start blowing up because that is not going to happen. You're just, we don't move the needle that much in, in the sport. So you have to find, you might move it in a, like they, they might get a phone call and pick up one contract, two contracts here. But most of the time when we sell something based off of our logos, it's not even trackable. Yeah. So you can't even really put that in a year in report, like our quarterly report. You can't prove it because the sales are all uh, indirect, if, if that makes sense. So you ha that, that's why it's hard to sustain it. It's hard to go back to the company at the end of the year and say, hey, I need you to write me that entry fee check again. And I'm like, what did I get out of this? And in your mind, you feel like you, it's like, well, I'm pretty sure these two houses you built over here were because of my advertising. But he's like, well, I don't know that we can't prove that. But if he was over there working and helping frame those houses, he says, man, I paid Gerald $50,000, but he worked for me $50,000 worth of hours. And so it's not, it's, it's unquestionable. Um, you know, so that's just how you, that's just a way. I mean, the reality is it is a sign a deal and then sit at home for six months out of the year and go fish tournaments the other six months out of the year and do two photo shoots and two, uh, winter, you know, hog trough demonstrations. Like what you're talking about is you're working your butt off, but you're you gotta work still your able off. to chase your dream. So to speak, it's giving you an avenue to chase your dream. Yep. And, and, uh, yeah, it's well, I lost my train of thought there. Sorry. But, uh, you're talking about the framing of the houses that you're showing them that you work for fifty, fifty thousand dollars worth, but then you also added more value by bringing in some contracts. Yeah. Um, man, what I had a, a topic I was trying to go to, but it wasn't your fault. I just completely. Let me look that was me. Here. I'm bad about that. I get a little bit of hate mail every now and then. It'll be like, just shut the hell up and let the guy talk. I have a little note here that just says, shut up. A note that says, shut yeah, up. on the, on the screen. <laughs> just a little self reminder. But anyway, we'll just, we'll just keep moving, moving on. But I, now I relate that same mindset with my, even my endemic sponsors. Um, mm -hmm. And so social media is not my thing. I freaking hate it, but there is, I still do what I got to do to, to, cause my sponsors still want me to, to do that kind of stuff. But yeah. all the conversations I even have with my endemic sponsors now is it's like, if you're looking for 
a Ben Milliken or a Guggen Squad or somebody that's like really powerful on social media, I said, I'm not your guy. That's not what I do. I'm a professional bass angler. And so the media that I can offer you is going to be through that platform. I will do my social media stuff, but I'm not, I don't have the attitude of I'm a professional bass angler. That's all I want to do. I'm also offering them my consulting skills and still talking to them. Like I'm going to be an employee for you. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do? Whether it's R and D, do I need to get on zoom calls, um, business development meetings? Do I need to help? Uh, how, how can I help grow your brand? They got to pay someone to handle business in every category of the company. So just put, put some of those categories on me and don't necessarily rely on me to move your needle through social media. Because first of all, whenever I have all these social media expectations, it gives me a really bad attitude. Like I really don't even want to participate in it. If I could, if it was up to me, I would, delete all that stuff uh but it's that's not reality um and 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 so in order for me to maintain a really good attitude in the fishing industry i have to find ways you know people tell me oh you got to be good on social media if you want to make it in professional bass fishing and and uh i'm like and so that gives them a bad attitude i'm like no you don't you just have to find another way to be valuable to a company and we've gotten sucked into this tunnel that you got to have a YouTube guy following you around at the boat ramp and making these elaborate YouTube videos that all look the same. And we're going to make all these generic social media posts. Uh, look at my this, look at my that. And this is what I'm doing today. And, and none of that stuff's actually doing anything for any of these companies. And um, and so. I've found a way to kind of deviate from yeah. that. And, it may, and that's what keeps me having a good, solid, positive attitude to the industry because I'm not sitting there going, I hate this industry now because uh, it's, it's, I'm not doing it the way everyone's telling me it's supposed to be done. I'm trying to do it my own way. And that's what keeps me really motivated in it and successful. And then, like I said, you got these guys coming in the sport and like, I don't have a social media following. So that company wouldn't even talk to me. It's like, well, stop trying to sell your social media. You have 2000 followers and you're getting 10 likes on every post. Forget that. Focus on the bass fishing and think, how can you be valuable to this company in other ways? Um, Not saying the social media thing doesn't work. It works for a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys that are really successful, Mm -hmm. but they're, you know, not everyone could be a Bill Dance or a Hank Parker and get on TV and have this awesome television show. Not everyone is a social media personality or an influencer, if that's okay. But you, I promise you have some other skill set that's valuable. What's interesting is this past hour, hopefully it showed, you know, the big sign, the big logo that's on the jersey or that's on the boat where typically, you know, guys would go, ah, he must know someone. He must have a buddy or a brother that works there. What you've done over the past hour is shown the substance behind that logo and what goes into it and actually show the value. It's way more than just, Hey, you know, I'm sure there are some of those deals where the guy calls and he's like, Hey, I need a tax write off. And it's the guy's brother or uncle is like, I want it all just whatever you need. I'll sponsor you. But those are, you know, rare, (laughs) but, but what you just showed is what you showed is something that has nothing to do with bass fishing to the general world who you like, I would look at SWAT over the last six years and yeah, I knew what it was because they sponsored you, but I will never be a SWAT customer or a Brown and root customer. But you just showed it over the past hour, why it makes sense for these companies to be involved in it and the value that it does provide to them. And I think that I was very, very interested in this show. I wasn't sure where you were going with it. You did a hell of a job, man. Like it's probably one of the most intriguing BTLs that I've ever done. Oh, wow. That's, (laughs) that's a big deal. And you know, I'm, 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 I'm down with helping. If, if you're a professional angler and you want to reach out to me with some ideas, you're like, Hey dude, I'm thinking about approaching this company. I'll tell you if it's stupid or not. I'm like, no, you probably want to try this or that's not really a good idea. You know, I don't mind having that open conversation with people now. Um, I'm far enough in my career where I don't mind fully explaining all of this because I've realized how much it helps everyone, including myself. This last non-endemic sponsor is a result of uh, me helping some of my buddies 
bring these same type of companies in the industry and it shed light to this company. And so it all came full circle to me. And that's whenever I realized I was like, you know, the more our industry as a whole understands this and gets away from this, this uh, social media mindset, you know, I felt like we was, we was kind of heading down a social media black hole. And, and, um, and so we, we need to have, we need to have a, a, a refocus on, on, on these non endemics. Um, I mean, just go back and watch some old Bassmasters, old FLWs. Everyone was covered in non endemics. Mm -hmm. Now, the big deal is you're talking about a non endemic where, where you are the. So, like FLW was a weird deal because one could argue that the non endemics hurt the anglers because they were non endemics that were team deals that were supplied through Irwin Jacobs Connection with uh, Walmart. So, you weren't able to develop an actual relationship. There were some anglers that did it that still have some of those that actually got to the. Uh, non-endemic person and created those relationships that you talked about and showed the values, but the vast majority just, you know, here's your jersey, here's what you're wearing this year, 20,000 bucks in entry fees. Uh, but yeah, what you're talking about are individual relationship non-endemics more so, you know, the team deals were there, but I don't know how much the anglers actually benefited from that personally and developing a relationship with those companies, how much they were just like, hey, you're the Pringles guy. You're the Cheez-Its guy. Now, Bohannon's one of those guys who developed a relationship with the people at Pringles. I had him on a show and we did a whole show on how he gives value to Pringles still to this day, fish in the opens. But he works his butt off behind the scenes just like you do. He's, you know, it's not just, hey, put it on the boat and we're going to sell billions of cans. It has nothing to do with that. Well, you have to force these relationships. It's an angler's fault if, if Walmart, uh, puts a, a big Snickers boat wrap on you and snick and you don't find a way to build this relationship. Yeah. That's you on know, you. It's, that's on you. It's like you telling me that you have a, you're fully representing this company and you can't find a way to get in touch with the CEO of the company and say, Hey, I just want you to know I'm here. And I just want you to know that I'm willing to do more than just represent your Snickers brand on tour. Like how else can I contribute? And they might have said, really nothing. We just want you to do what you're doing. But at least you showed that willingness. Um, you know, a lot of these guys mm -hmm. were just taking the money and putting the logo on. But right now, your foot's already in the door. And it's on you to try to build those relationships. And, and, and you know, one thing, anglers are always, people in general, they're always feel entitled and and they and they're going they're going to cry about everything and 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 so when anglers were sitting there complaining about getting these Walmart deals these package deals and they were saying that was bad for the anglers how many anglers today would take that deal because those deals don't exist now yep. so an angler that's an up and comer in the Bassmaster Elite Series that has no sponsorship if I said hey dude I'm gonna give you this Walmart deal it's gonna pay your entry fees and that's it but you can't do anything but this. How many guys would take that deal? A lot of them. So we take it for granted is what I'm saying. And then, and not every deal might be a personal relationship. You know, you have to look at it. Um, what, however you can to get a non endemic sponsorship. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to go do it the way I'm saying, I'm just saying this is another way to be creative and try to go find that. But you need to look, man, I'm sitting there watching TV sometimes. And I don't care what it is. If a commercial about Tommy Copper comes on TV, I'm sitting there looking at that. And I'm like, man, I need to send an email with, uh, and I got a, like a big email that, that's got all my media, all a proposal, all my assets, all jumbled into one with clickable links to watch some live stream and stuff like that that I'll, but you can just sit there and watch some commercial and you say, man, I don't see them on anybody's bass boat. They're not in the fishing space. Let me see if I can get in touch with whoever's in charge of marketing with this company and offer them a marketing package that they might be interested in. Well, in that aspect, they may not be interested in you working for them. They might just want the advertising. Well, you give them a realistic number where, mm -hmm. where it's easy for them. You don't say, hey, man, give me. $250,000, I'm going to wrap my truck and boat. 
they're going to they're, they're gonna shake their head. And he goes, no, you need to prove that we have so many eyeballs seeing that before we're willing to write that kind of check. Uh, but if you go to them, you say, hey, I'll do a truck and boat wrap and you'll get all this exposure uh, and you start talking twenty to $40,000, then that's not a big deal to a big company that's doing a lot of marketing. So you just have to look at it. Try, try not to get caught up in doing it the same way that everybody else is doing it. Um, to put it in fantasy football terms, <laughs> when you're going through the draft, fantasy football, if everyone's picking running back, running back, you, you tend to do better if you go wide receiver, wide receiver. Mm-hmm. So just just do it different than everyone else. And it's, it's pretty easy right now because everyone's – thinking the exact same way. So it's, all you got to do is just think outside of the box a little bit and come up with a, a different plan and um, and you'll be successful in the sport. I like it. I named the show Outside the Box Sponsorships. There Joe you go. <laughs> uh, man, we could go on for hours and hours about this. Uh, excited. Let, let's talk just a little bit of fishing and then I'll let okay. you go and then we'll take all a right. break and I'll come back. I do want to talk about it. Uh, a tough, uh, tough, but a cool tournament that went down over the week in uh, Alabama that I actually Sunday morning turned uh, turned my smart TV on and was like, wait, live coverage of fishing on uh, January 21st? Absolutely. And then I watched it and was very impressed with it. But uh, season kicks off. You're in Redcrest this year. Maggie's due during Redcrest. Like you've got a new title sponsor, like the next – two and a half months are going to be very interesting for you. Yeah, we have a lot of irons in the fire, which I'm excited about. We're, uh, we're starting plans to build us a new home at the same time. So we'll be working on that this year. Um, like, like you said, my wife's due with our first baby. He's going to be a little boy. Um, he'll, he's due eight days after red crest. So he could come in the middle of red crest. Who knows? Um, and then, and then we'll be traveling with a with with a baby, a cat, <laughs> and and Maggie. Uh, so, yeah. And then a new title sponsor. Where, I, you know, I told them to load the wagon. I want to take as many customers on fishing trips and do as much stuff with our customer base as possible and be as impactful to that company as possible. So I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can for them to justify the investment they made in me. Um, So it's going to be a busy year. Excited to go back to the Every Fish Counts uh, format. You've been remarkably consistent in your entire time on the BPT. It doesn't really seem to Matt, I mean, you've been, I think, what you've been in the top 50 every single year, right? Somewhere around yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You fit 43rd, 48th, uh, 10th, 42nd, 32nd. Um, re- regardless of all the rule changes, you seem to just keep plodding along and, and making good money. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can perform on with either format, but I hate every fish counts. Um, it just for me as a tournament competitor, I like to be able to slow down and practice and mm-hmm. and um, be able to build strategies around five fish and make moves like, you know, I got my limit. Now, how do I go catch a big one? And then and then telling the stories around all that kind of stuff is that is that is what I love. That's my passion. Um, but we did that last year and I absolutely loved it. It's not really something I would say just benefits me more. Like I feel like I'm going to have more success in it. I just personally like it more. I feel like every fish counts. Um, No matter how good your practice is, you're never, or the tournament or anything, you're never comfortable. Mm -hmm. And one of the fun parts about bass fishing is when you get that sense of comfort and that uh, like, oh, dude, I had a really good practice. I know where I'm going to get my big bite. I know where I'm going to catch my limit. And it just makes that tournament way more enjoyable when you execute a uh, a plan like that. And you just don't have that comfort with every fish counts. So you're stressed out all the time. <laughs> if you're getting 25 bites in practice, you're thinking everyone's getting 50. You're like, mm-hmm. I don't know. And then you're going into the tournament. Usually I could say, oh, it's going to take about 15 pounds a day to get paid. Well, you don't know what it's going to take to get paid. 
and, and uh, what every fish counts. You know, like, I don't know how many fish I got to catch. Um, so a lot of times that's when it's nice to be group B because you can look at the score tracker from group A and then uh, you say, oh, I can do that. And then that kind of like sets the pace for the rest of the tournament. But uh, or sometimes they catch them so good. You're like, there's no way I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, there's no ceiling, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to do however I got to fish. I'm gonna go and and try my hardest to perform. I'll say I like the schedule this year for the BPT. You start out with two potential slug fests, but also fickle fisheries. Uh, Toledo Bend, January 30th, and then Santee Cooper. Uh, really excited with some new additions to the fishery. I've, I've talked with Justin Lucas off air about this, and he's like, dude, we got 40 freaking guys on the water. We've got a smaller field. We can start going to some of these kind of off-the-wall places. I really like the Dale Ho Dale Hollow. I really like the Choan River. Uh, Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma has been a popular stop, but for a lot of the BPT guys, it'll be uh, the first time that you've seen that fishery in your life, and then uh, the James River in June, and then the St. Lawrence in August. So, uh a couple mystery events, a couple standard events, a couple potential events, and then a couple grinders in there. It's a solid, solid schedule. Yeah. So Toledo Bend, if it's anything like it was before the off limits, it's going to be a catch fest. It's, uh, nice. there's so many fish in that lake. It's unreal. And I haven't been there in a long time. Uh, even though I live, close to Toledo Bend, just we haven't had any tournaments there since 2017 Elite Series. Uh, if you think about it, that's the last time there's been a professional event there. And now we're going there and Bassmasters is going right behind us. Um, and so it's going to be a forward-facing sonar tournament, uh, you know, and so I didn't realize how many fish were in that lake with this new technology. You can literally stop anywhere on that lake and within 10 minutes catch a fish that's uh, anywhere i don't care if you stop in the middle that's just what i like hearing after weighing five for eight one on the open last year gerald just keep talking about it <laughs> well <laughs> everyone thinks no i agree <laughs> toledo is toledo is definitely uh on the upswing uh it's, there's fish everywhere uh yeah and, and it I seems to be healthy too very healthy before the off limits, there was just tons of two to three pound bass and they looked perfect. Like they was raised in an aquarium. I mean, they just looked absolutely perfect. There's so much bait um, and the fish are really healthy. And I expect these guys to absolutely throttle them in that first event. I, I can't even wrap my mind around what I think the weight's going to be to, to make the cut over there. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see after all this rain um, and and this cold weather if it's any different than it was before the off limits period. Uh, anything else you want to get in here? Any other additions to uh, sponsor lineup in the twenty four season that uh, that deserve a mention? I hate putting guys on the spot because then they text and they're like, "I can't believe I forgot so and so." I've been busy on it. I did. I did uh, switch to. So I've been with Quantum the last six years of my career, but they got acquired by Rather Outdoors and they just, they decided to turn that brand into a saltwater brand. Um, and, and so that was an opportunity for me to explore the market with Rod and Reels. And after I started asking a lot of questions, um, the, the one that stood out to me the most was ARC. Uh, they have they have a product line in the rod and reels that is comparable to the top rod and reels in, in the industry, uh, if not better. It is the nicest stuff I've ever put in my hands. I've never, ever had nothing this high end in my hands. Um, I mean, you could compare them to Daiwa, Shimano, all of them. And I have they got a pretty big team. And, and I started asking some of those guys, I was like, is this stuff really that good? And they, and they all say the same thing uh, that, you know, they got $300 reels, 300 and something dollar rods, but they have price point stuff too. And then when I put the, 
the the hundred and twenty dollar reel in my hand versus the three hundred dollar reel that they're, they're very comparable like i can't tell the difference they seem like even the low end stuff the lower end stuff is really high quality and so um and then my buddy randall tharp mm-hmm. you know he's my boy and he got his whole line of rides and all that stuff and um so he was one of the main reasons i said let me really check this out and then i met louis with arc and i feel like he, I feel like we're buddies already. You know, Dude, like I sat buddies. next to Louie at a, at a industry banquet. One of the mornings that I cast last year and was, I didn't know him at the time. And he's like, Hey, Louie, you know, our, our, our president, a whole dude, big fan of Louie. I've eaten awesome. one breakfast with him. And I, like I said, I feel like I'm like buddies with him and I've met him for like 30 minutes. So, so that's, that's something just to end and to wrap it up with, but whenever you have really good non-endemics, it allows you to focus on endemic sponsors that you truly really want to work with. Um, and so it allows you to be a free agent and say, man, do I take this little 2,500 or $5,000 check? I'm going to take whatever I can get, but Mm -hmm. I really don't like that product at all. Uh, you can either, pick those kind of companies and be miserable and not have any growth in the company. Or if you have a really solid non-endemic, you can say, this is the clothing line I want to be with. This is the bait company I want to be with the rod and reels I want to be with. Uh, and, and then when you enjoy the product within companies you work for, the, those not, those relationships naturally grow. Um, and so that's why I picked arc because I love Louie and, um, and I like, I like everybody on there on their pro staff and their product is second to none. Um, so that's, that's my only other deal for 2024 besides Brown and Root. I like it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for jumping on and talking about this stuff. I think that was a valuable, uh, valuable show that will definitely help, uh, help a lot of anglers, regardless of whether you're in the Toyotas or Invitationals trying to make it to the BPT or the Opens trying to make the Elites or the BFLs wanting to step your game up or anything. Yeah, and even if it's a BFL, uh, yeah. you know, even if you're like, man, I can't afford that. I want to fish X amount of BFLs. It's going to cost me a couple thousand dollars be- between hotel, gas, and, and a few entry fees. Go to your boss and just say, dude, you give me – three extra days of vacation and I'll give you an extra 20 hours worth of work. If you just help me here, you know, and it, you could do it on at every level, uh, whether it's a BFL level or, or opens or whatever. If you like, I just want one entry fee paid for or two entry fees paid for mm-hmm. you can, you can negotiate time for money. And, uh, and that's really how you got to think about it. All right, Gerald, I'm going to let you go. Uh, Check out Brown and Root. It's a cool website. They spent some money on their website. There's, I learned all about it over, over this morning since you, since you came on to talk about it. And you then know, uh, Brown and Root has 10,000 employees. That's a lot of employees. That's a lot of employees. So we got 10,000 new fans in bass fishing. Yeah, they got 10,001 now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with, with you, with you yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> After the way you worked. All right. Uh, take it easy. Good luck. Uh, congrats. Yeah. You got a lot on your plate. Good luck. We'll just focus on the first thing in front of you, which is to catch him at Toledo Bend in eight days. Yep. That's it. <laughs> hey, do you do any like, uh, do you do any like hired out trips or anything as a captain? Like if people want to go out there and fish with you, I started a new show on Fridays called guide day or mm-hmm. are you, do you kind of keep it? To- no. It's all, it's all private with the, with the sponsors that I work with. Um, Yep. If you want access to those, those uh, excursions, then sponsor sponsor me. That's all you got to do. And you, I'm a package deal. There you go. All right. Take it easy, Gerald. All right. Take care. Thanks. See you. All right. That was Joe Spore. Very interesting show. Uh, We're going to take a break when we come back. Like I said, talk about what uh, I would consider the first event of uh 2024 also some stuff going on on the west coast btl on a very icy and snowy monday january 22nd we'll be back right after this the new puma sts has been redesigned from the ground up with the angler design function and performance in mind 
Nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years' experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. Having confidence in your tackle while on the water is one of the main things to success in my opinion. In the last couple of years with Denali, I've had just that. From anything from spinning rods, casting rods, tungsten products, even now to casting and spinning reels, I have the confidence to go out there and get the job done and know that all my equipment is going to handle it and do it just the way I want it. The thing about Denali is you've got great quality products at a great price point, so make sure you check them out. All right, we're back. Uh, BTL on a Monday. So I got up yesterday morning. I'm trying to. I, it's chaos. If you listen to the show I did with Matt Stefan, I'm trying to get ready for uh, the Bassmaster Open that kicks off next week on Lake Okeechobee. I'm actually in really good shape now. I spent the last couple of days working on it. But I turned on my smart TV and I saw recommended under YouTube was to watch the ABT 100, the Alabama Bass Trail. Now, I guess uh, Kay Donaldson runs that. Uh, Luke. Duncan is like the MC of that. Uh, Darren, they had a couple guys that are involved with it, but it was a really well produced product. They had, uh, I think, at least three boats on the water, good audio, good commentating, like a studio. You're talking about a little under 100 boats, a thousand dollar entry fee, the Alabama Bass Trail. Uh, it was on, I believe, Neely, Neely Henry, or no, one of those spotted bass lakes out there. Yeah, I think it was. No, it wasn't Neely Henry. I don't know where it was. It was on wherever. Oh, no, I'll, I'll be able to tell it right here. April. Logan Martin. It's on Logan Martin. Uh, but I was very impressed with it. Uh, there were 700 people watching on YouTube when I was watching it. I don't know how many people were watching. They had sponsors, commercial breaks. And then you kind of go through the list of anglers that are fishing this ABT 100. Uh, and it's a very eclectic group of talented eggs wesley gore canterbury uh tom frank justin atkins uh hamner alan glasgow's fisher classic alex davis brent crow sam george trey swindle jimmy mason who was just on guide day kelly J, and johnny mccomb so you're talking uh elite series flw tour uh opens local legends and then it was won by uh Jed Lamb and Andrew Loberg, who is a California transplant. We've had Andrew on the show numerous times. It's like in his mid twenties, uh, transition from California to Alabama. They had 1752 and one. So just something that I saw that I wasn't, uh, planning on watching that popped up and I ended up pouring a cup of coffee, working on tackle and watching it for two hours. So very impressed with that. Uh, working on a show for tomorrow on, Wednesday, big show on Wednesday, Emil Wagner, the 2024 AFCO Bass Boot Camp recruit will be on to talk about fishing all nine opens. And then we return with Uncle Frank on Thursday. Then I am headed off. We have a full week of shows uh, recording this week that will run next week while I am in Okeechobee. So you will not be missing any BTLs. Like I said, once again, Joe Spore, thank you for reaching out. Very cool show. Uh, 
And there's yeah, there's a lot to digest in that show. Just a lot of different, but but something that everyone can take out of how it's done. And and he's done a very good job of doing it. And I've seen firsthand like he's not blowing smoke. That that's how he's doing it. Uh, and kind of pulls the curtain back on some of those what I would call unique non-endemics where you don't really see the direct correlation between bass fishing and that non-endemic. But after that show, hopefully you kind of ex- understand how it works a little bit better. All right. Uh, yeah, I got to take the truck out. We'll see if we can make it without ending up in a ditch in the first 50 yards. It's been another edition of BTL. Same place, same time tomorrow. Later. Later.